So we're going to continue our discussion of credit scores and insurance. And then uh, if we have time at the end, I want to do some thoughts on car safety. Uh, a really good topic for paper two would be the insurance industry's impact on how cars are manufactured, how streets are manufactured, and, and signal lights and signs. The insurance industry has had a huge impact on just safety of how we drive around. And then telematics, we'll talk real quickly on that, just the impact that is having. And then um, get into autonomous vehicles a little bit. This is a popular, popular topic for paper two. Hasn't quite advanced the way people are hoping that it would. So it's, it's looking like it's many more years away, if at all, but it is still an interesting topic for the industry. And it is related back to car safety because while we do not have fully autonomous vehicles, there's a whole lot that has been built into the car to make it a separate set of eyes for the driver, which is pretty interesting. So even if we don't go the full autonomous, cars will be definitely, and they already have, been taking over more of the responsibility for car safety while we're driving. This first article, there's two articles. So the key here, you've got two articles. Uh, and We'll, we'll, get in, we'll, we'll get into the specifics of these articles. I want to set the stage first at the very, very high level before we get into these articles. So back in the class notes on page 34, let's just at a high level. Uh, what, what you need to understand is that there are two studies and there are three questions, all right? So when we get this, this is going to be an exam question, so just realize on the exam, it's extremely important. There are two studies answering three questions. The first study is a univariate study analysis or analysis. The second study is a multivariate analysis. And the first study was all they thought they were going to do, but then the question of multivariate came up and so they did phase two of the study. All right, so phase one, what they mean by univariate analysis is they just looked at credit scores to see if they had any relationship whatsoever to claims, frequency and severity of claims for auto and homeowners insurance. So the first question on the first study, the first study answers two questions. The second study answers one question, all right? So the two questions in the first study was, is the relationship, is there a relationship between someone's credit scores and their likelihood of filing a claim, either the, the frequency or severity. And we'll talk about whether credit scores are related more to frequency or to severity or to both. And the answer to that question was absolutely yes, there is a relationship. It is a strong relationship, although the relationship is stronger to frequency than to severity. And we'll talk about that. There's a logical reason why that would be the case. All right, so that's the first question. Under the first study, the first question is, do credit scores have any kind of predictive ability related to the frequency and severity of auto insurance and homeowners claims? The second question under the first study is, is there a disproportionate impact? Remember last class we talked about the different types of discrimination. discrimination. The first two were illegal. The one where, com where companies discriminate where there is no data backing that. The second one was when the discrimination is based on race or religion or nationality. Those two are illegal. The third one, disproportionate impact, is when insurance companies discriminate on something they do have data for that is not illegal, but the result is disproportionate by race, income, age, or different types of things. Now, obviously, age is okay because insurance companies do discriminate based on age. But that's, the question is, is there a disproportionate impact? Is using credit scores going to mean that certain race pieces, people of different races, people of different incomes, people of different ages, will they be impacted differently than if you didn't use credit scores? And the answer to that was yes. Credit scores definitely have an impact on things. Some of the things they have an impact on are illegal if they were explicit and direct, but as as Montemayor points out, insurance always has a disproportionate impact, and that in and of itself doesn't make it illegal. You'd have to show 
that credit sc sc scores are a substitute. They direct 100% substitute for something that's illegal. So if you could look at someone's credit score and know exactly who the person is, know their nationality, their race, their gender, their, their age, uh, if you could know all that, just looking at credit scores, so the credit scores is just a, what he called a, a surrogate for something sinister, I'll just love that phrase, then it would be illegal. But that's not the case. It is, there is a disproportionate impact. However, inside each race, people with good credit scores, let's say we have green people and purple people. Green people might have, on average, better credit scores than purple people. And people with better credit scores drive better, have better driving history. So if you use credit scores, green people are going to get lower auto insurance rates than purple people. That sounds discriminatory. Maybe that should be illegal. If you could use credit scores to know for sure who is green and who is purple. However, that's not the case. Within purple people, while purple people are going to pay more for insurance because on average they have worse credit scores, within purple people, purple people with better credit scores drive better than purple people with bad credit scores. And because of that, it's, it is not explicitly illegal. There are a lot of people, a lot of purple people with great credit scores and they will get low auto insurance rates. There are a lot of green people with bad credit scores and they'll have to pay higher rates and those higher rates and lower rates will be justified because the people, the green people with bad credit scores will actually on average drive worse than the green people with good credit scores and the purple people with good credit scores will on average drive better than the purple people with bad credit scores. So that's the disproportionate impact is there. The question is, is it illegal? And Montemayor is going to say, no, it is not illegal unless the state of Texas makes it illegal to use credit scores. But at the end of phase one, so there is phase one with two questions. Is credit scores, is it predictable? Does it help predict frequency and severity? Number two, is there a disproportionate impact? Well, then he said, well, you know, maybe credit scores, maybe it's not a surrogate for race or income, but maybe there, if you look at other factors, other inputs to insurance, and you put them all together, maybe all of them together do just as good a job as credit scores. Maybe credit scores do not add any additional information over what we have in other factors. So they want to do a multivariate analysis to see if maybe credit scores by themselves are predictive, but they, when they're added to other variables, other rating variables, they don't add any additional information. So that's the purpose of the second study. You remember, I started with the second study with the letter from Montemayor to the, to the governor because it did a good job of summarizing, summarizing these issues. And so what the second study found was uh, the use of credit scores is it significantly improves pricing accuracy, and I, these this is a quote from the from the study significantly improves. So it's it's actually one of the strongest variables insurance companies have found. All right. So the second phase wanted to see is there a, is credit scores really needed? It's so controversial. It, creates a lot of complaints to the insurance uh, commission. It creates a lot of complaints to politicians. I remember I was in my car driving home from work or something, and uh, I think it was Joe Pags on 1200 AM. He was interviewing a gentleman from Allstate, and they were talking about the use of credit scores for auto insurance. I mean, it's also used for homeowners insurance, but auto is where the problem is. And the guy was real friendly, and he was trying to you know he was taking his punches but boy the people calling in were irate they were so upset and the question that's the obvious question what does my credit score have to do with my driving and so we'll, we'll talk about that this idea of predictive ability correlation versus causation actuaries are not saying that bad credit scores cause people to drive poorly in fact, actuaries don't really care about causation. That's not what they're looking for. They're looking for relationships. Now, it's possible bad driving causes bad credit scores. I doubt that's the case either. 
I doubt bad credit scores, scores cause people to drive badly. I doubt bad driving causes people to have bad credit scores. I don't think there's a cause and relationship either direction. But actuaries don't care. They're looking for the relationship. What might be the case is factor C. Factor C might be personal responsibility. So that's why you know young young people get really mad. Why are you using credit scores? I'm already young and you're charging me more because I'm young, but because I'm young, I also have bad credit scores. It sounds like you're double counting there. I think the way actually set it up, it, it doesn't actually end up double counting. They already have the age, they already have the credit score. They're look, already looking at the multivariant when they, they, they do this. Given that you're 23 and have a bad credit score, what does that mean? It's not like they're adding more money here, adding money here. It's the combined that they're looking at. But young people especially you know what give me a break I'm, I'm young so I have uh, you know you're charging me more because I'm a more dangerous driver I'm not experienced as a driver and I have a bad credit score because I'm young I don't have my credit history you're really really beating up on me there and but it might just be that young people are not as responsible as older people you know a 45 year old man driving a, a van that has three small kids and is married that's a very different person than a 20 year old kid um, no 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 family young a little little crazy just because they're young you know it's the, kind of the, the the joy of youth is that you know be a little bit risk-taking yeah they're different people they're going to be more risky and so maybe there's that third factor which is personal responsibility maturity experience it's those kind of things that drive that both are the cause of good driving and the cause of credit scores and cause of bad driving. So insurance companies know what that don't really know what that third factor is. Also, it's probably not measurable. It probably does have some overlap with other things, but you see where we're going here. So insurance companies, they found a factor that is very predictive for frequency and severity of claims. And so they're going to use it unless the state says no. We'll talk about why they have to use it. Um, what you're going to see in the complaints, first of all, is this issue of availability. So we'll talk about telematics and how that might help fix this. But if you think about it, young people that are in low-income areas have low credit scores. They're also, because of their low income, are going to have a tough time affording insurance. And then the insurance industry uses credit scores to pump up their their insurance rates even more that's really going to affect availability and affordability I mean availability and affordability are very very similar so what the insurance ar industry argues is it may not be affordable but if you allow us to price our products correctly we will make it available so without credit scores we we can't offer insurance because we can't distinguish between risk. So it's we're just going to refuse to sell in certain markets, um, or just sell at all to certain age groups or whatever. We just we just can't afford it. So rather than charging 20 year olds with good credit scores a low rate and 20 year olds with bad credit scores a high rate, we'll just charge everybody extremely high rate because this this group is just too risky. But by allowing us to use credit scores, we can now make insurance available to those responsible people with, with, with good credit scores. So insurance argues availability, the critics argue affordability, and those two are very closely related. So uh, we'll see that when we look at kind of the critiques of regulation, what it's trying to achieve, affordability, availability, and inadequacy are the, are the three issues. We'll see that coming, coming up here so these are good terms to keep in mind availability that is insurance is there that can be purchased and it's you know it's it's something that people have access to affordability very closely related that is you have access to it but it's so expensive you can't possibly buy it and that certainly has a relationship to it and inadequacy Adequacy is the rates are not too low. So available is it's there to buy. Affordability is not too expensive. 
and adequacy, adequacy is not too cheap. And by not too cheap, this gets back to what we talked about with the Warren Buffett annual report. Is remember he said, you know, you got to be willing to walk away from the business if it's not priced correctly. This is the adequacy that the insurance industry is charging too little, such that they risk to risk insolvency. Insurer insolvency, not the insured, but the insurer insolvency. So think back to Buffett on that. That's insurance that is not priced high enough to cover the risk. So these are three terms, especially if you're interviewing with an insurance company, a property and casualty insurance company. You would not talk this on the life insurance side, but on the property and casualty side. Availability, affordability, and adequacy. Regulators started off, we'll talk about this later with regulation. Regulators started off really focused on adequacy, making sure insurance companies are not, not going to go insolvent. They weren't really focused on these other two because they thought it's a competitive market. We just got to make sure it's not so competitive that you don't have insurers out there undercutting prices to try to get business. Now, today, insured, ins insurance regulators and, and legislatures are far more focused on availability and affordability. And that's mainly because insurance become much more political. We actually had states that have elected insurance commissioners. It's a much more um, political process. We talked about um, uninsured motorists in states that require uh, people to buy insurance. And that has made availability and affordability even a larger issue. All right. So these, these are all issues we'll see again when we talk about insurance regulation. But it's all related, very closely related to this whole use of credit scores. So insurers all say we can make availability better if you let us use credit scores. Their critics say, yeah, but that makes affordability a issue for a lot of people. Um, then other views, we'll get through these and... We'll, we'll talk about some of these issues. We'll see them as we go through that. We just talked about this correlation issue. All right, so let's, let's go to the actual studies. But the key I wanted you to know is three, two studies and three questions. Two studies, three questions. Study one has two questions. You want this incredibly explicit into your essay on exam two. So those students get really frustrated. Why did I get full credit? Make sure... Um, I want to make it real clear that you have a good organization. I'm not saying this because this is the way I like you to organize it. I'm giving it to you. This is exactly what the state of Texas did. Phase one, two questions. Phase two, one question. So let's look at the executive summary of phase one. First, they pulled data from six leading insurance groups. So 1.2 million personal auto, 800,000 homeowners. So a, a good good sample size uh, and here's the two questions does it impact certain classes of individuals more than others that's the disproportionate impact and does it predict claim experience all right the initial findings the individual policyholder data shows a consistent pattern of differences in credit scores in different racial ethnic groups so that's that first question is there disproportionate impact absolutely there are People of different racial and ethnic groups do have, on average, different credit scores. The second question, they answer the first two questions in the right in the bullets. The second question, there appears to be, notice that word appears, they're already setting up the second study. So the word appears, they leave a little bit of doubt, but they see there appears to be a strong relationship between credit scores and claims experience on an aggregate basis. It is necessary to evaluate if and to what extent credit scores enables an insurer to more accurately predict losses. So you can see they're already setting up the second study. So yeah, there's a relationship, but does it really make the pricing process any more accurate? Could they eliminate credit scores, use other things, and still get what they need? The department is in the process of conducting a multivariate analysis. So there's that second study. All right, I know it's been a while, 15 years, but Texas is the only state, as far as I know, that has done this. So we're, we're kind of stuck with this older study. I'm quite confident that it has not changed dramatically, although we'll talk about telematics. That is a big issue. 
The individual policyholder data does not include information on income. So the department had to do a little bit of guessing about income based on zip codes and other things like that. Um, so yeah, you can see, and they're just submitting, they have some data issues. Insurance companies don't collect that type of data. If they don't collect the data, then the department has to use zip code to try to guess what people's incomes was. The individual policyholder data shows a consistent pattern of differences in credit scores depending on age when younger people have worse scores. So we know it's impacting age. Age is already legal. Insurance companies can already discriminate based on age. They're one of the few industries that can. But the question here is, is this double dipping? Are insurance companies overcharging young people by charging them both because they're young and because they have bad credit scores? The number of credit-related consumer complaints in the department increased substantially. So consumers do not like this. Now, I say consumers. This is similar to the mold thing. We say, well, consumers are upset because you're not covering mold. Well, the consumers who were filing mold, mold claims, they were upset. The consumers that never filed mold complaints, they didn't want mold cover because their rates would have gone up 40 to 60%. Same thing here. Consumers with bad credit scores are upset, but consumers with good credit scores, it's not like they were riding into the department saying, I really love this, don't change it. They were probably completely unaware that they were getting a 40-50% discount on their insurance rates because of their good credit scores. But obviously, they would notice that the state made use of credit scores illegal, they would suddenly see a huge increase in their rates. So consumers complaining would be the consumers with the bad credit scores, not consumers with the good credit scores. Based on a review of rate filings, and this is pretty important, 42% of homeowners and 55% of personal auto premiums use credit scores to some degree in either determining your rates or rating tiers. These numbers do not include those insurers who use credit information to accept or reject applications for coverage. So some companies, they'll say, and we'll talk about an article about Allstate uh, in California because California says use of credit scores is illegal. But all states said, well, we're not, we weren't using it to rate policies. We weren't charging people more and less um, for insurance. We were using credit scores to say whether we'd accept them as a customer because we, we didn't trust them to actually pay their bill. So they were doing it as, as a way to say, you know, we didn't want, we don't want to get bad checks or people who just, who didn't pay us. And the state said, no, you, you can't do that. Rates varied as little as 11%. In one instance, up to 400%. All right, so you get a, a little bit of the lay of this. So let's get into the details. I'm just going to do the highlighted section. And as I said last class, you can just do the highlighted section as well. Uh, you might occasionally look um, in more detailed places if a word stands out to you. Um, so the legislature actually came to the Texas Insurance Commission and... So they're required to give a report to the governor uh, on the use of credit information by insurers in Texas. That's, there was a law passed requiring them to do this study. But you know, it's interesting to me, a big part of legislation at the state and federal government isn't a new law, but it's a requirement for someone to do a study. So, you know, our government spends a lot of money or causes people to spend a lot of money to do studies. Uh, it's always interesting, what did they do with the results of these studies? Uh, my risk management class, we talked about the Dodd-Frank that required just massive amounts of studies. And the question people have with the millions of pieces of information being sent to the government is who's actually collecting that and looking at it. But here's a case where the study was done and it looks like it was very specific to task and gave they gave the governor, governor and the legislature some really specific information to work with. So I, it seems like they did a good job here. It doesn't look like it was extremely expensive to Texas taxpayers. So this might be a, have been a good use of uh, government power, maybe. Credit scores are typically calculated using a model, which is essentially a mathematical formula. Some of y'all might have some background uh, on this from the banking side. The inputs to the formula are various credit-related statistics, the output is a single number numerical value known as a credit score. Now, this is pretty critical, too, because what if an insurance company says, you know what, we won't use credit scores, 
Instead, we're going to use number of credit cards, number of collections. What if an insurance company, instead of using credit scores, try to create their own credit score database? Well, to do that, they would have to show each one of those things, number of credit cards, number of collections. They have to show each one of those has relations. And I'm sure there are some insurance companies that have taken credit scores and broken down the components to see if there is one of those components that was specifically the most important one tied to auto and home insurance. So I, I don't have that kind of inside information, but I'm sure some have tried it. Obviously, credit scores is a very mathematical, statistical thing that actuaries would have no trouble dealing with uh, and getting the data and the understanding. It's all out there on the internet somewhere, I'm pretty sure. So, you know, it's it would be interesting. You know, credit scores are not doing anything radically different than what actuaries are doing, and actuaries are probably better at the math than, than are as good at the math as the people producing the credit scores are. Here you see the number of complaints. And then an important chart here is the impact of credit scores on, on um, your premiums. So some saw as much as, well, 3% or so saw as much as a 40% uh, discount. Maybe 2% saw 60% or more. If you look at here, 10, this is what, about 20% saw a discount of 20% or more. Uh, what was that, 5, 10, maybe 20% saw as much as 20% or more. And a majority of people, it was between a 20% discount and a 20%. So 2020 is, I don't know what that is, 20, 40, 50, 60. So probably 60% of people, it was somewhere between plus and minus 20%. The chart shows that as insurers started using or expanding credit score, the vast majority of policyholders experienced rate swings from 40% decrease to 40% increase. Almost 10% of port policyholders experienced more than 40%. For homeowners, the impact was not as dramatic, and this is important too. Credit scores are better predicting auto than home. I thought it was interesting on the complaints that there were more complaints on home than there were on auto. That, that to me seems a little bizarre. Um, you would think, because most people who, that I've heard, like on that radio program, most of the complaints were on the auto side. 90% of homeowners experience rate increases of less than 30, 30%. So 40 versus 30 for 90%. There's the, there's the homeowner side. From an availability. All right, so there's that availability. Affordability, avail affordability, availability, and adequacy. They all start with A's. Affordability, availability, adequacy. These are great terms to keep in mind, mind if you interview with this industry. They're really, really critical to this industry. From an availability perspective, insurance companies argue that the use of credit scores improves their ability to measure risk and therefore allows them to expand the spectrum of risk they write. This benefits consumers because insurers, insurance may become more available and may be particularly beneficial to more marginal applicants who might otherwise be declined coverage. So essentially, you know, you got this 21-year-old person, they're in a neighborhood that's, that's dangerous, but this 20-year-old has a really good credit score. The insurance industry says, hey, you know what? We can now give this person insurance that's at a good price, and they couldn't have got, if we hadn't used credit scores, they would not have been able to got it, obtain that. On the other, other hand, the increased rates for policyholders with below average credit or higher risk may make insurance, un, there's that word affordable, unaffordable, and essentially unavailable for some consumers. You see how availability and affordability work together. Insurance companies say it's available for those good people that are in bad spots. So they're, they're a good driver, but we don't know it because everything else we know about them makes, they're in a risky risky category. So we had credit scores, now we got new information, now we can take care of them. Um, however, those, there's people that are going to be impacted by, by their bad credit scores, and then that actually takes them from being Expenses to unavailable because the credit score kicks them to that that unaffordable so unaffordable um, 
Now he notes, they notes, this outcome could occur with the use of other rating variables. So the credit score is not the only thing that does this. I think what people are really concerned about is credit score is so closely related to other things that are, are people are already struggling. So, you know, inner cities, they're, they're higher crime areas, and so auto insurance, homeowners are going to be more expensive already there. There's, there's a tendency in certain areas to be lower income, and you would assume they would have lower credit scores. And you bring all that together, and it's like credit scores is like piling on. Just more and more and more is being put on these poor people who already are struggling. And so some consumers may question the relevance of credit scores uh, to the risk of probability of insurance claims. In contrast, the relationship from more traditional ratings, age, driving record, that doesn't cause people. People don't complain that, why are you charging me more just because I got five tickets? That's usually not a complaint. Um, even on age, younger people, I think, have somewhat just accepted that younger people are going to be charged more for insurance. Um, they probably even agree that the data probably shows young people don't drive as well as older people. Uh, you know, most young people I know say, yeah, that's probably true, but I'm, the, I'm a good driver. As studies have shown, 80-something percent of people think they're an above-average driver. And so young people say, yeah, you know, I, I see why they're charging young people more, but it's unfair to me because I'm, I'm the good young driver. But um, that's probably not true either. We tend to uh, exaggerate our own abilities. All right, we're getting through this. I, here, here shows the, 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 the groups, the breakout of the groups. So you see a lot of statistics by zip code, by age, by race. Um, some of these charts, I think, are a little hard to read, but um, there's some really key charts. I think you really you want to put them on your exam. You may actually want to, since the exam is going to be online, you may even want to snip a picture and put it into your answer. All right, one real quick thing we just have to understand when we look at these charts, there's some these charts I want you to use in your answer. It's the difference between auto and homeowners and how they're reporting it. You can report, now this is only property and casualty side. We don't use these terms on the life insurance side. So, um, and in fact, they're using the term pure premium here. If you take my life insurance class, we call it the net, N-E-T premium, the net premium. And here they're calling the pure premium. The pure premium for auto insurance, that's the premium you were charged if the only thing you were charging for was claims. You didn't have loss adjusting expenses. You didn't have under, other underwriting expenses. You didn't have a profit. You were just going to charge a premium, and all it would cover was your claims. That would be the pure premium. The loss ratio for homeowners, we've already talked about loss ratios a little bit. Remember, we talked about the combined ratio when we we're doing the Warren Buffett annual report. The, loss, the combined ratio is losses plus loss adjustment expenses plus underwriting expenses over premiums. Well, the loss ratio is just those claims, those losses as a percentage of premiums. That might be 60-70% for homeowners. All right, remember the combined ratio for auto is usually like 95% to 100. That includes uh, losses, loss adjustment expenses and expenses. The loss ratio, auto insurance does have a loss ratio. They're just not using it here to report their findings. They're using the pure premium. But the loss ratio is just your claims over your premiums. Homeowners, they're using claims over premiums, and so what their loss ratio is. For auto insurance, they're just saying, what premium would we charge if we only covered the claims? All right, so when we look at these charts, and they give a definition at the bottom. Pure premiums defined as a dollar amount, a basic limit, losses per vehicle per year. So a pure premium of 200 means that, on average, insurance claims are $200 per vehicle per year. That's just the frequency times the severity. It has nothing, no other expenses in it. Loss ratio is a dollar amount of losses divided by the dollar amount of, here it's earned premium. We'll get into this a bit later. The combined ratio doesn't use earned premium, it uses written premium, so we'll get into that. So this is a little bit different loss ratio than in the combined ratio, but it's close enough. A loss ratio of 70% means that they incurred losses, well, we'll when we do commercial insurance, I'll give you a good definition of incurred losses. Being, but just think of it, it's just the total losses they, they're responsible for in a given year, whether they pay for it in that year or not, it's that year's losses. 
incurred losses, 70% of premiums. And for homeowners and auto incurred losses and paid losses, the cash losses are usually about the same because they pay their claims pretty quickly. All right, so this is an important chart, chart seven. This is the one I would definitely keep in mind whether you pick, took a picture and put it into your answer or you draw it by hand. So this is the personal auto. Now there's a lot of charts and we're, I'm just taking this one because it's, it's, it, it shows a story. They're looking at pure premium again. So this is the premium they need to charge based on these credit scores. So the best credit scores, they should charge about $175. The worst credit score, they should charge over $350. So there's a 100% difference. The highest pay 50%. A best credit score pays 50% of what the worst credit score pays. And you can see there's a very strong relationship here. Now the question is, is this through the frequency or severity? Do people with good credit scores, do they file fewer claims? Or do they file about the same number of claims, but they're, they just have really low losses? So maybe these people file thousands and thousands of claims, but their average claims about the same as these people. Or maybe these people file the same number of claims as these people, but when they do, man, they total their car. Which is it? And it's probably a combination of the two, but you're going to find them. Studies shows that frequency is more, more important. Now think about there. There is some co-collinearity uh, co co here. If you think about it, you know, it's just kind of obvious, and we'll see this even more so for homeowners. You would think people with good credit scores are probably wealthier, and therefore they probably buy more expensive cars which means their severity is probably higher. Their average claim should be higher because they probably buy more expensive cars. Now, I'm going to say I have data to prove that. I'm just saying the logic of what you might assume, assume is people with better credit scores are, tend to be wealthier. And people with low credit scores are either not as wealthy or if they go out to buy a car, they're going to be limited in what car they can afford. And as a case, in that case, they should have lower severity. So we'll, we'll talk about it. We'll see what the data says about severity versus frequency. Here's homeowners. You can see it's a little bit more wicked of a chart. Uh, here it's 100% versus 300%. So it's, it's, it's much more skewed. Now here we have a serious problem with the data that they'll talk about in the study. And, and it's a problem we've already talked about previously in this class. And it's while they were doing this study, it was right in the middle of the mold, the mold crisis in Texas. And remember the Ballards with their million, multi-million dollar house, they probably had a good credit score. So here it's probably even more skewed that people with good credit scores can afford a mortgage, so they actually own a house. So they're much more likely to have higher claims than persons on this end, on this end. This is probably more renter's insurance, and so the claims will be much smaller. So you would think there would almost be an inverse relationship between credit scores and the severity while there'd be a direct relationship from frequency. But they're going to admit that because of the mold crisis, they had a little bit of much more, much more uncertainty on the homeowner side than they did on auto. So, all right, so here it is on frequency and severity. The department also looked at claim frequency and claim severity. They defined these down here. Frequency is the term number of claims divided by number of earned car years. So since the number of claims versus, you know, how many, how many, because you can, one household can insure three or four cars. Severity is defined as a total losses claim divided by the number of claims. Like essentially the average claim. So frequency times severity is your pure, pure premium. We, we talked about that earlier. So the department looked at frequency and severity. The data shows that credit scores has a higher relationship to frequency than severity. As the credit scores improves, the frequency decreases. People have fewer accidents. Severity may decrease as well, but not at the same rate as frequency. So in some cases, it's nearly flat. But again, there's you would think the relationship. Now, I'm not saying that all wealthy people have good credit scores. I was actually pretty shocked. There's some data in here, which is pretty shocking. There are some very wealthy people with horrible credit scores. It is, you know, how, how can someone get their life that messed up where they have plenty of money and they're still borrowing too much money and they can't manage their finances. So there, 
there's some irresponsible people and not only are they irresponsible in their finances they're also below average drivers so it's like it's it's all it's all working together and there are there are poor people with great credit scores they take care of themselves I know some people in, in some income levels of 20 30 40 thousand dollars and boy they are so good with their finances so but you were talking about the average and the trend obviously wealthier people have higher better credit scores than poorer people on average but within each one of those groups there's going to be quite a bit of variety so they do some charts on frequency you can look at severity i mean not much of a relationship right and this the people with no scores look like they're really dangerous dangerous drivers the issue is not whether credit score scoring is related to claim experience, but rather whether credit scoring provides additional information. Again, they're setting up the second study. So they say, okay, this study, it's obvious. The data is strong. There is definitely a relationship between credit scores and claims experience. But does it provide additional information? Make sure I, you definitely need those, that, those words, additional information, in your essay for exam too. It's extremely important. So, and this next part is important too. Additional information versus what? Over and above traditional or existing rating variables. We'll talk about these rating variables when we get into the second study, which can enable and ensure to more accurately predict loss. This is a really, really critical, this is on page 22. This is a really, really critical one since you can, since you, you get to, um, write this essay in advance of the exam this might be a good place to actually you know when we do the written exam without open book you've got to do this off the top of your head but here you could actually quote the study and this if you need a transition between phase one and phase two this is the perfect sentence right here to get you there all right then they have all these charts at the end i uh, hope none of you printed this out uh, these charts i i think i think it's a little overkill there's very few charts in here. A lot of them is redundant. They're just, they have a bunch of different groups. And so, you know, some of them are interesting because there's some, some charts that look more related than others. I mean, some are crazy like that one. So I, I, I really, when you get to the appendix, I would just, just stop. I don't care anything about anything down in the appendix. I mean, if you're one of those go-getters and you want to find a chart that really strengthens something in your answer, go for it. I think you're going to find a lot of these charts are a little bit confusing and why they put all of this in, into the study, uh, really not sure. So there's that first study. We're going to, going to get into the second study, and here's the perfect setup for the second study. So refresh your memory. Uh, Montemayor, the insurance commissioner, great guy, really brilliant man. Um, very popular with the insurance industry. He was, uh, I think, probably a little bit on the pro industry side, but a very s smart, very, uh, very capable man. I just like the way he he, he spoke and, and, and a very honest man. So I, I I I think you know from that standpoint, very good in, in his in his role. He really understood the issues. He understood the math definitely. He wasn't actuary, but had a strong uh, statistical background. So he comes back at this report. Remember, he talks about the two phases here. Talks about disproportionate impact. And re remember, he says, that's not illegal. I can't do anything about disproportionate impact because the law does not forbid that. He talks about the second phase of the study. And here he gives the answer. The second phase indicates that credit scoring significantly improves. That's that. Remember, I had that in the class notes. I quoted that directly pricing accuracy. So there already, right in the very beginning, he has the answer, right? He writes very, very well. He doesn't take 40 pages to get to the answer. He comes right up and says, hey, our second phase, look to see if credit scores gave additional predictability, and they absolutely do significantly improves pricing accuracy. He then talks about unfair, intentional discrimination and disproportionate impact. And we, we went through here, it's like, you know, like, I, I cannot make disproportionate impact illegal unless I can prove that it is a one-to-one -one match to something that is illegal. If I can prove that credit scores perfectly predict race, color, religion, or national origin, then I can make it illegal. However, our 
if credit scores vary within race, color, religion, national origin, they don't perfectly predict them, I cannot make it illegal. So as commissioner, I can end the practice that is either unfairly or intentional discriminatory. I cannot end disproportionate impact and in prior, in fact, disproportionate impact is there all the time in all categories, you know. There may be more young people in one, there's maybe disproportionately more young people of one race versus another race. So obviously charging people more because they're young is going to make that race have to spend more for auto insurance than another race who has more senior citizens. So there's disproportionate impact all over the place. So here's a surrogate for something unlawful. He later says a surrogate for something sinister. I love that phrase. There would be evidence that credit scoring was a con Coincidental, var coincidental variable, that's another way of saying that served as a surrogate for an unlawful factor, then he could make it illegal. The study, however, did not support these initial suspicions. Now, he says initial suspicions. He says, you know, I, after the first study, I really thought probably credit scores was just a coincidental variable and really didn't add much power. I, I'm not sure he thought that. That might be what the team who did this study was thinking, I, I'm pretty sure when Montemayor, he spoke to my class twice, I got the sense he, he knew going in that credit scoring was very strong and that it would be shown strong even in the second study. So I didn't get that sense from him speaking to the class that he had strong initial suspicions. So he may be somewhat here wording this for um, not just himself but the whole team that put this together. So he says Credit scoring is not unfairly discriminatory. Notice he said unfair discrimination. Um, intentional discrimination, unfair discrimination, you know, I, I, I think those two are, are switched in the way they're, they're, they're defined. Um, but actually here, you know, he, he's actually being a little sloppy because it's, to me it's intentional is the biggest, big, biggest issue. It's not intentionally discriminated by the laws, so unfair. unfair it's, it's neither, right? So it's not unfair because they do have data to prove there is a relationship. It's not intentional because credit scores are not a surrogate for race and color and, and nationality. All right, there's a few more things in here that I think are interesting. Some of these are not specifically related to credit scores that you'd want to put into your answer, but more related to just the whole way statistics and actual science work and how they do studies like this. So I encourage, especially my actual science majors, you're going to see some terms in here that very much relate to your, your training in mathematics and analysis. And most of my actual, all, all of my actual science majors know these terms, they're studying them in their classes, so it gives you a chance to see, you know, statistics being applied in a rather useful way here. So for both both personal auto and homeowners, and here to talk on personal auto liability, credit score was related to claim experience even after considering commonly used rating variables. We'll get into those a little later. This means that credit scores provide insurers, and there's that term again, additional information. And here they added another word, additional predictive information distinct from other rating variables. By using credit score, insurers can better classify and rate risk based on differences in claim experience. All right. Now, specific to auto liability, credit scores related to the probability of filing a claim or claim frequency. The department found very little or no statistical evidence credit score related to claim severity. For homeowners, credit score was related to frequency. The department found some statistical evidence that credit score was also related to the amount of a claim but was unable to draw a definitive conclusion. Why? Because of the mold crisis and also because of some, some hurricanes. So think about this with hurricanes and other things. There's a lot more on the, auto, on the homeowner side that is completely outside of the, the realm of anything credit scores would, would impact. Um, hurricane, earthquake, tornadoes, those kind of things. They, they tend not to be looking for a neighborhood based on credit scores. Uh, and in fact, there are actually may be a negative correlation that neighborhoods who are more like more susceptible to hurricanes might be wealthier neighborhoods living on the coast and thus might have better credit scores. Who knows? 
But because of the mold, because of the, the very large claims that mold saw and some storm events, the homeowners were somewhat distorted information. For personal li auto liability, credit scores vary in importance depending on the model the insurer is using, but it is generally comparable importance to territory and driving record. That's pretty major. Driving record, credit scores is similar to how many speeding tickets someone gets. Are credit scores related to where you drive? That is really critical. Uh, California had a big blow up, and we'll talk about this, this proposition in California where they made it illegal to charge people living in the city more than they charge people living in the countryside. Uh, and oh man, when they, they had that election, people in the countryside voted 90 something percent against it. People in the city voted 90 something percent for it because territory is huge. People living in the city obviously pay much higher for insurance because they're much more likely to get into an accident. So think about that. Credit scores are similar to territory and driving record. How many tickets, how many accidents someone had. Only class, that's age, gender, and marital status, was consistently more important than credit scores. For homeowners, credit score was one of several variables. The department was unable to draw a definitive conclusion, and again, because of the noise of the data. Both personal auto and homeowners, the difference in claims experienced by credit score was substantial. You notice how they keep looking, using these, these, these terms, uh, substantial, significant. It is important to ascertain whether the relationship between credit score and claim experience provides significant additional information. To, this, to study this issue, the department conducted, there's a multivariant analysis. So how did you do that? So these methods were classified. This, this has always confused me a little bit. Statistical or actuarial. And my actuary major students say it's not really that we're using different statistics in actuarial science. Their thought was when you say actuarial, they meant something that was specific, statistics specifically using the jargon of insurance. It was still statistical, but it's very jargon-laden insurance type of terminology. So I, I guess that's okay. That may be sense. Make, make some sense. Statistical methods involve construction of statistical models by fitting hypothetical probability distributions to the individual data. The actual methods calculate a relative claims experience by rating variables directly from the data and were used to cross-check the conclusions of the statistical data. Some of your actual science majors have probably done this in some of your classes. The department included several common rating variables in this multivariate analysis. So here are some co common variables you can see in the footnotes what they mean. Territory means where the vehicle is garage. So that's somewhat important, right? In, in Bear County, if, if you live 10 feet inside Bear County and you, that's where you garage your vehicle, vehicle versus 10 feet outside of Bear County, your rates will change dramatically. And it's because Bear County has a very high auto theft problem. And because of that, just, just moving a few feet outside of Vera County can have a huge impact. Territory for homeowners is obviously your address. And, and for homeowners, you know, territory is kind of all that matters. For a vehicle, your, your car may be garage somewhere, but you, you may be driving 20 miles to work or 50 miles to work or whatever. So auto is a little different. Class is age, gender, marital status. Young people drive more dangerously than older people. Men drive more dangerously than women. Married people drive safer, or single people drive more dangerously than married people. Protection class re refers to the quality. This is released to homeowners. You know, fire protection, how close is the fire department? Construction class, obviously homeowners. Is it brick or frame? Um, they look at whether the policy involves minimum required limits. Is it just basic, or do they have other coverages? Model insurance, obviously, that's going to have some impact, especially when you get to, um, to severity. Driving record reflects at-fault accidents and vehicle-related convictions. They say serious. I don't know if that includes tickets. I think it would, but it definitely includes DWIs and that kind of thing. Um, so these are the kind of things that they're looking at, and then you have credit score there at the end. There's, there's other things in there, you know, the fact that you have both auto and homeowner insurance. But they put all these things in here. So that's what, when you buy insurance, these are the things that they're looking at. 
In every case annualized, the statistical approach to identify credit scores as being related to and is statistically significant, again that word significant, to claim frequency. So frequency really stood out as being related. For homeowners insurance, the department concluded that credit scores was one of several important via, uh, predicting variables. However, the department was unable to draw definitive conclusions. The relative small number of large claims accounted for a large portion of total. This gets back to that mold and to the hurricanes. Um, so on the homeowner side, they're worried that the data problems might give an issue. Remember, on homeowners, credit scores did not have as big of an impact as on the auto side. This is a concern because of the unusual circumstances related to mold claims that were present in the data. When water damage and weather-related claims were excluded, the average rankings placed credit scores as the most important variable followed by terabytes. So look at that, that place. Once you take mold out of this data, credit scores as the most important variable followed by territory, obviously territory is extremely important, the deductible and the age of the home. Now how many rating classes are there? Well, theoretically, there probably aren't this many in real life, but theoretically the study so they could have come up with 3.6 million different categories. I don't know how many people live in Texas, maybe 40 million people or something. So, you know, it's, you'd almost have one class for every 10, 10 people. So that you could get you down to a class where there's only eight or nine, ten other people in the state of Texas that are in your class. Now, I doubt insurance companies go quite down to that level. Um, maybe they do. Who knows? Um, so they did regression analysis identify, and that identifies and measures the relationship between the dependent variable and explanatory variables based on data. It does not provide any causal information. I have a former student of mine who's very heavily involved in educational reform, and he's constantly bringing up this issue, the difference between correlation and causation. And he's real careful in his studies to say he's not talking about causation, he's talking about correlation. And he gets beat up quite a bit from people who, 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 who mix that up. Here's, here's one of the models they're using. You can use your actual science. You probably use these, these terms all the time. Um, gamma distribution, a generalized linear model using gamma distribution. So you're hopefully you've seen some terms that you've seen in your, your class and what it means. The, this distribution, this particular distribution implies that the expected number of claims is proportional to the length of a policy period it is commonly used in insurance models. Um, the department noted that some statistics indicated the actual data were less dispersed than expected. The department did an explanatory analysis. So they're saying and some of my actual site students read some of these and they said, you know, that, that would generally in our classes have raised serious concerns. So there were some actual students that say, you know, we're not convinced this study was as, as clear as, as they said. And here they talk about the gamma probability. Um, so some of, the prob some of these statistics are used on the frequency side. Some are used on the severity side. Um, Chi-square, I remember using chi-square, but I, boy, it's been a long time since I've done that. Um, and, and how they use it, R-squared, you know, we in finance use R-squared all the time. They essentially say R-squared was not particularly useful in this study for some reason. Um, they did provide the R-squared, but they said the R-squareds were very low. That's, come, you know, for us in finance, we're like, well, that's that's the only thing we look at. So that that means it's a bad study. So that's that's interesting. These simulations illustrated very low R-squared statistics typically resulted even if the regression model exactly mirrored the process. The example also illustrated that the regression models accurately measured the underlying variables and their impact even when the R-squared was very low. So that's, that's interesting. You know, it just shows that we in finance are not quite as strong in statistics as we probably should be. So anyway, no, no appendix, no table here. So uh, I want to go back to the class notes and just final summary on this. So you got the two studies and the three questions, and the final answer is yes, it does disproportionately impact certain groups of people, but credit scores significantly improves. There's the issue of availability, affordability, and then adequacy. Um, we talked about the affordability issue. From a society standpoint, 
if we if we have statistics that can identify bad drivers versus good drivers, isn't society better off by pricing the bad drivers out of affordability, but then providing really good public transportation? Wouldn't that be better for society than instead saying, hey, you know what? The statistics show they're really bad drivers, but boy, we, we need to get them behind the wheel. We need to force these insurance companies to cut their insurance rates so that these bad drivers can drive. Um, the other side of this is piling on. People already in bad situations, they're getting charged more because now they got bad credit. And then you have the false positives. There are good drivers with bad credit scores. There's also the false negatives. There are bad drivers with good credit scores. How do you solve that? And we'll talk about that next with telematics. Well, in a little bit, not next, but we'll talk about telematics and how that could, that could work. There's the question of relevance. What, what does my credit score have to do with my driving? And, and insurance companies say probably absolutely nothing. There is no causation, but there is correlation. So there's probably a third factor that's going on. So that's where he uses that. It has a, it looks like a, it's a surrogate for something sinister. I talk about correlation here, but, but there, there's a lot of examples of correlations that are high correlations. I had a, a data science scientist from USA talk and I forget what she had her example was it was some famous actor and how many movies he did was related to something completely unre so if you look at there far enough you will find relationships to the pure random noise is it possible credit scores or that kind of thing and the answer is probably not because the, the relationship continues so it's not like it just worked for five years because if it just worked for five years Statistically, it's extremely unlikely if it's just pure random chance that it works for the next five years and then the next five years. So we call that add us out of sample and credit scores continue out of sample to continue to show this strong relationship. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a touchy political issue, but the actuaries say, hey, you know what? It accurately reports claims experience and it works well. And we'll talk about telematics. Maybe telematics is the way to solve the problem, not for the people that are bad drivers and have bad credit scores. Their, their rates are going to be higher because telematics will identify them as bad drivers. I'm talking about those people that are good drivers with bad credit scores. Maybe telematics would be the solution. So we'll, we'll finish this up here, and then we'll have a few more issues to talk about where auto... And then we'll get into commercial. I don't like commercial as much, and it's a lot of overlap with what we've already done. So I know we're getting behind on the syllabus, but I'm fine with that. I'd rather short, shorten up the commercial side anyway a little bit just because I, th I think you're going to find we, we already have covered that.